Hi there, I'm Caleb Langworthy. I uh, run a grass-fed lamb and beef operation down in Dunn County, Wisconsin. Uh, I also have small farm work as a technical service provider for an organization called the Savannah Institute. Uh, Savannah Institute, where is our clicker? Oh, there it is, all right. <clears throat> Savannah Institute, the mission of the Savannah Institute is widespread agroforestry across the upper Midwest. So what do we take a look at? We see this all across our landscape where we have conventional agriculture, annual agriculture, we have pasture, and then nature and conservation is separated from that. The goal of the Savannah Institute is to intentionally integrate uh, trees and pasture and livestock into one single system. Uh, my goal here today is to give a real high level overview of silvopasture, just uh, maybe touch on a couple of points where the Savannah Institute is uh, pushing the ball forward uh, and then um, have a conversation about how Leslie was able to work on silvopasture by reduction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we see uh, uh, forest production uh, is could be 70% of a uh, given space. If we add pasture production into that, we get a land equivalency ratio of more than the acre that we have because we are using multi-strata uh, in our fields. Have we seen this? I have this on my farm. Right? You're lucky. Yeah, one, one, one tree, and it's still alive, right? Anytime my sheep get out, anytime my cattle get out, they're concentrated under there. We just learned about how nutrient uh, concentration can happen under a single block of trees. So, yes, lightning is a real concern when you have one single tree. I've seen it. I've been out on folks' farms, seen that, seen that steer. <clears throat> what are they reacting to, right? They're, they're showing us and telling us that they are, under, they are undergoing stress in their production. So why silver pasture? Largely, uh, I mean, there is a lot of sail in the winds of the grazing movement uh, and planting trees these days uh, because we're carbon friendly and we're doing good things for the planet, and that sort of a thing. I very much view silvopasture as almost armoring myself against uh, weather changes that are happening right now. Uh, just this last week, I looked up uh, Dunn County, uh, where I farm, and in the last three years, uh, we've either been in abnormally dry to D2 drought, except for about two months. Uh, I have sandy upland soils. Um, they dry out quicker. Uh, we run out of forage quicker in the summer. So uh, livestock comfort is a part of this. Also forage production is a part of this. Uh, some, this is an older study 20 years ago, so I'm just gonna name that. Uh, but the industry livestock uh, the losses that the U.S. industry has exhibited from heat stress in this 2003 study is thus. It's a significant amount. This is old numbers. I'm sure it's higher uh, at this point, but that's the uh, most current data that we have. The University of Kentucky Animal Research Center has done uh, a fair amount of uh, studies on the increase of daily weight gain in different classes of animals that we can see here. <clears throat> Cattle on endophyte infected fescue have 40% higher pregnancy rates in shade systems. There are real economic benefits to having shade and comfort for your livestock. Right, Nick pointed this out, right? There was a good option for moving nutrients around on your farm. And with those types of systems, we see a 20% increase in cattle uh, weight gain. That's the University of Kentucky. Tree shade, 
60%. So there's a real economic benefit to having your cattle and shade uh, integrated with one another. <clears throat> University of Minnesota, uh, a study of master's student just finished her studies, and I believe it was like 2019, it says. Uh, forage quality is higher in silver pasture systems versus open systems. Calves average higher daily gains in silver pasture systems. So what are we looking for? We're looking for even shade throughout our pastures. We're not looking for that first one where they're all concentrated around one single tree. We're looking to spread that out. You can see all the benefits that we uh, gain from even shade throughout the pasture. How do we do it? What are we looking for? A lot of this is really goal dependent. Um, I, our farm, uh, my partner and I are big fans of holistic management. We have holistic goals that we uh, go through on our farm. Uh, I encourage all of my clients to go through some sort of holistic uh, management goal setting process or whole farm planning process uh, prior to planting any sort of trees on their farm. Trees are a very uh, long-term prospect, and identifying your goals at the outset is the best possible thing that you can do to have success in your uh, tree planting. So, you know, lots of different ways that we can think about this. Uh, if we're animal product driven, right, where I'm a beef producer, I'm a land producer, I'm looking for shade for my animals so that they are more comfortable. I, uh, you know, I might be looking for a fodder source. Uh, in years like this, and I'm, I'm really concerned about drought, um, having a supplemental fodder source might be something that uh, I would want to consider on my farm. You know, if we're looking at plant product driven uh, systems, uh, say, I want to put in an elderberry orchard, or uh, a nut orchard, or an apple orchard, then the animals serve in more of a, a maintenance sort of system, and, and that interaction is very different. <clears throat> so how do we get there? There's a couple of different ways, addition and subtraction. Uh, I'll cover both here really quickly. Um, I, I think it, there's something to be noted that both of these systems uh, do require management intention, intention, management intensive rotational grazing. Uh, Silver pasture does not exist without management intensive rotational grazing. If you are trying to add trees onto your pasture and you are set stocking them, they will eventually rub against your trees and you'll kill them that way. Uh, if we are doing silver pasture by subtraction and we are set stocking our animals, they will uh, they will uh, compact the root zone around the tree and they will eventually kill the tree. I drive all the way across Wisconsin. I see this all the time on roadways, I'm sure everybody does, where uh, a producer has just let the cow in or the, the herd into the woodlot and that woodlot is destroyed. Um, that is not what we were talking about. That is a very different system than what we are advocating for here. <clears throat> so uh, by addition, uh, this is a, a dairyman down in uh, I think he's in Westview, Wisconsin, uh, and he was, is adding uh, shade to his heifer pastures. Uh, so he is just looking for livestock comfort so that he can grow a healthier heifer. Uh, this is uh, uh, an example of fodder sources that are largely coming out of New Zealand. New Zealand has a system. Uh, Dave Engen here. There we go. Oh, there we go also is planting for fodder source. Um, the idea behind uh, planting trees for fodder is that we uh, have a more resilient feed source. So as we're in that summer slump uh, in late July, August, and we're running dry on feed, that we can, it's called pollarding. Uh, this would be an example of a pollard on a willow tree, uh, drop that feed source for those animals. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, willow uh, in particular has uh, some natural deworming effects on for small ruminants. Uh, 
um, early days, but some tree crops are uh, shown to increase weight gain. Uh, Lynn asked us to specifically focus on small ruminants. There is a study out of the University of well, I'm sorry, Virginia Tech. They have honey locust pastures, and what they found was that lambs, once they identified honey locust pods as a uh, feed source, were able to gain faster than the control group, just from pods falling on the ground. And Are you then, sure that's not just a whole bunch of snakes? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <clears throat> but uh, free feed, right? And free feed at a, a time of year when we typically would be short on hay. Uh, mulberry uh, has also been uh, identified as having a high protein content, somewhere between, depending on, on the uh, cultivar of mulberry, uh, but between 14 and 34 percent protein, um, so incredibly high. Um, these can be pollarded as well. <clears throat> um, I will advise that white mulberry is invasive. Do not plant white mulberry. We are looking for rubra or red mulberry. There's a couple of different ways uh, to incorporate that into your farm. Uh, the right would be an alley cropping system, uh, and this easily could be grazed right through here or cut for hay. Uh, it's a little easier of a management system than the silva pasture system on the right, uh, in which there are a few more trees to work around, but also that shade is more evenly dispersed, so it's up to the individual producer what their goals are. These are pictures of Savannah Institutes. Uh, they have a campus of farms down in Spring Green, Wisconsin, where they're doing a lot of demonstration around these ideas and principles and doing some testing. Uh, they have a flock of sheep uh, and have planted in a chestnut orchard. And they are rotationally grazing their sheep flock through that, uh, that chestnut orchard. <clears throat> they are doing so with I think it's like a, a five strand, uh, a five strand a perimeter fence. And they are testing a couple of different methods of protecting these trees from the livestock. This one is just a control with no polyline on it. And right over here, uh, we are protecting those trees with just a single polyline that is connected to those tree tubes. <laughs> so this is kind of how we're trying to crack the nut around adding trees into existing pastures. Uh, these these uh, tubes here come from, uh, uh, there are many companies that produce uh, tree tubes. Uh, they're like mini greenhouses for tree tubes. They uh, come in all sorts of different sizes. We found that the company Plantra produces uh, a tree tube that is ventilated all the way up and down the tube and has a fair amount of growth. We also recommend them because it has a fiberglass stake in it as opposed to a bamboo stake which often rots out by the time that we need it. <clears throat> they also come with these handy dandy uh, nets on top so that we are being uh, good neighbors to our songbird friends. Uh, it's sad to see go check on your trees and find out that there's a songbird in there. So it's worthwhile to put those on top as well. Um, so how are, we, how are we protecting these trees, especially with, with sheep? It's a little less of a concern. If we are talking about beef, it's a little bit more of a concern. Uh, we're utilizing tools that every grazer has at their disposal, polywire. So this has been a technique that's been developed by uh, a cow, cow calf uh, producer down in Tennessee. Her name is Wynn Miller. There's a wonderful presentation on YouTube. Uh, Wynn Miller, if you Google Wynn Miller Appalachian Sustainable Development, um, you'll come up with an hour long presentation that she gave on her system. Uh, she's been developing this along with another gentleman from Pennsylvania called uh, Trees for Grazers. His name is Austin Unruh. Uh, the idea is that the polywire would come from your hotline and you would come along and then there's a connection point here in which we wrap the tree tube itself 
uh, so that the cattle or sheep don't rub. Um, thus far, we've had uh, pretty good success with it for the last, I think we have, in Wisconsin, I've seen systems that are about four years old at this point um, and have successfully survived uh, rotational grazing. Uh, you can see right here, often these tubes are up six feet high um, so that cattle can go underneath it. And we're working with that company Plantra to create little extenders so that we can bring that electric poly wire up so that we can have uh, traffic uh, lanes as well. It's a couple of <clears throat> pretty basic shots on how we attach that to the tube. As we're looking at our plantings in our silver pasture systems, we're often planting uh, for the near term, right? Every almost every silver pasture example, uh, every silver pasture client that I have uh, is looking for shade yesterday. They're they're nervous about the droughts. They're nervous about the increasing heat events in the summer, uh, and they want shade quickly. Um, but we're you know, those species of trees are often very quick growing softwoods um, and will cause you uh, some troubles along your fence lines in 20, 30 years. So we like to mix them up with other species um, like oak. This is an example of a design that a colleague of mine put together uh, in which we, the client was looking for uh, fruit and nut trees. Um, so they were specifically looking at chestnuts. Um, should have thrown a topo map on top of this, but this is essentially a ridge top where we left that open for grassland birds. And then this slope going down is where we installed uh, chestnuts, black walnuts, and uh, I believe it was apple. This is uh, my farm in Dunn County. <laughs> Um, this was mid-August last year. Uh, we were in D2 drought at that point. Uh, it had been for uh, a significant amount of time. Um, I put the slide in here because I felt pretty proud of the amount of forage that I had available for my cattle and my sheep at that point. Um, when you can see on, this is open pasture, and this is open pasture, had all burned up. Uh, by the middle of July with no rain. Um, this silver pasture on my farm kept me from feeding bales of hay in the middle of summer, um, which was significant cost savings to me. Uh, just some general information on uh, thinning out trees. Um, really, we're looking for 30 to 50 percent shade. I think my silver pasture is closer to 60 percent shade. Um, as they're thinning out, you want to adjust pH so that, uh, like Nick had mentioned earlier, more of our nutrients are available. <clears throat> and uh, as you're thinning, especially um, in areas that are prone to uh, straight line winds or tornadoes, we want to be uh, cautious of wind throw. Um, so I'm very cautious about the amount of uh, trees that I take out at any one time so that the remaining trees have some ability to withstand uh, the wind pressure that exists. Uh, I want to throw this resource up there because the Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota has been doing a, a, just a wonderful job around silver pasture by removal. Um, they have developed a, a fair amount of uh, case studies of farmers who have implemented silver pasture by removal and then they created this uh, site assessment resource guide, um, which is a pretty user-friendly um, guide for landowners to go out and say, is this a high quality woodland? Or is this a low quality woodland? Uh, we at Savannah Institute like to think of leaving just high quality woodlands alone. If we're looking at a site that was a uh, traditionally an oak savanna, or in my case, like a red pine plantation where there is a significant amount of uh, invasive brush underneath, that that would be a site that we would think of as a suitable site for silva pasture, but we're trying to leave 
um, high quality woodlands alone. Uh, am I running out of time? Two minutes. minutes. All right. Um, this is a red fern farm in Iowa. They are nut growers. They are on the end of using maintenance sheep for maintenance. Uh, this is uh, the <coughs> Sherburn National Wildlife Refuge managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, since 2017 through 2022, they did a five-year comprehensive study of pretty much everything. Bugs, bats, forage quality, um, herbaceous understory, and they did a pre and post uh, uh, evaluation of these after and utilized uh, Thousand Hills Cattle Company came in and did management intensive grazing to restore an oak savanna woodland. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, windbreaks and shelter belts uh, for livestock comfort. Um, wind roses are available online. You can find one through your site, and that tells you where and when you are getting uh, your wind for the winter. And it helps you plan uh, where and how to install your windbreak. Uh, generally, in windbreaks, we are looking at a shrub species, a, small, a medium sized tree, and then a large tree. And we're trying to create a ramp effect for the wind. <clears throat> uh, when we just go ahead and thin woods uh, and don't have this ramp effect, that's when we can get some wind throw. Uh, we've definitely seen that in Barron County. Uh, there is some straight line winds. A lot of producers are still cleaning up after that. Uh, this is the gold star thumbs up from my uh, employer. We have a technical service program. Uh, we have uh, tools that can help you plan uh, how what trees to put in for your soils. Um, there's funding available for all this uh, through NRCS Equip. Uh, there's also CSP programs that you can plant trees in. Uh, I should note uh, the Savannah Institute is a Midwest regional lead on a project called the Expanding Forest Agroforestry Project. Um, it is a large TNC grant and it has a better funding pool, uh, a better payment rate for producers than NRCS does currently for adding uh, trees into existing pastures. Um, $30 a tree. Uh, if you're an organic valley producer, there is also a carbon insetting program that they are working on, and they are utilizing agroforestry as one of the practices that they are uh, working with. So if you are uh, an organic valley producer, any of these um, practices a person could uh, get paid for over the long term. And essentially you're selling carbon credits back to the co-op. Uh, where can you learn more? We have fact sheets on our website, uh, crops. Um, there's, this is a great book if you're really interested in adding trees to existing pasture. Steve Gabriel wrote this and that's a, the silver pasture book that goes both ways uh, by addition and subtraction. The University of Missouri is a wonderful uh, university to get research on silver pasture. The Association for Temperate Agroforestry covers the entire United States. And on the right there, I put up a guide, but the, the National Agroforestry Center is also a wonderful resource. And that's a collaborative effort between the Forest Service and NRCS. Leslie. I was wondering if I was going to talk a lot. <laughs> Thank you. I think he did a good job setting the scene for the context for civil pasture. Um, I'm just going to, I'll try to kind of keep moving on my stuff because we were talking before. I get talking about goats in particular and grazing, and it, I guess it's kind of like bugs, right? right. <laughs> um, we can kind of get going. But, um, just for context, I am in the northeast corner of St. Croix County. I raise sheep and goats. Um, we direct market all of our, our goats and sheep as well, either direct to consumer or wholesale buyers. But today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're using um, working with silver pasture on our farm. And right now, we're in the process of, I'd say, renovating or by removal is the technical term, I guess, is um, on our farm. And we're not really in the, I'd say, like maintenance stage of an existing silo pasture. Um, but on our, on our farm, um, we have been 
as we've grown over the years with our herd and our flock of sheep and goats, we've kind of outgrown our pastures and also found the last few years with the drought like conditions ish in our area that our woodlands have actually been, and also grazing our hayfield has been kind of our saving grace for giving our pastures more time to recover um, and kind of help us get through the season. So um, as we've grown, we've started to, we will graze our pastures and then we've started to dabble over, the, not dabble, but kind of work on like grazing the edges of our pastures. So I would just add, um, use like portable fencing and jump onto our existing energizer that's in our barn and just graze the outsides. Is that good? Okay. All right, I'm taking my notes with me just because that way I don't forget to make it important for we'll tuck it right here. Um, but I would, you know, just to get started, I was just like basically stealing the, you know, my energizer power from my existing fence line and grazing along the edges and kind of seeing how far I could get out because we had a lot of our farm, like probably many um, over the years, you know, brush has started to creep up a lot of, we have a lot of buckthorn and also um, honeysuckle and things like that. And so there's a lot of maintenance that needed to be done. And so we kind of were using, utilizing that as another feed source. Um, and last year we started grazing our hay fields as kind of another part of that rotation as well. Um, this is, I'll kind of get into more of this, but I wanted to kind of just, again, set context. So the last, like, I don't know, around 2020 or so, we were doing some of this, like, grazing along our fence lines. We have um, on that back area, I don't know if, okay, down in the left corner, or down in the bottom, there's an oak savanna down there. But if you were in there, unless you actually saw an oak, you probably would, would think it was just a buckhorn jungle. So um, we were we were initially, because it was easy to access from our pasture and get our goats in and out without losing them. Well, there's been a few times where maybe they've gotten out, but that, we're not talking about that right now. But um, it's, it, was, it was feasible to get there. And so we worked on that area first, but it was, it was so thick that it was hard to like tackle. But we kind of did what, what, what we could with what we had for existing portable fencing and so forth. There was, the area was logged a long time ago, so we were putting up fence on the old logging paths and kind of working from there. Um, and then from there, we had already had worked with NRCS, like when we first got started doing a grazing plan and getting fencing set up on our farm. And so um, I had talked with our conservationists and actually we're, we were doing, when we started talking about this project, we were already starting CSP, so we had an existing relationship. And um, I'd asked about, and I, and I also learned about Silva Pasture and some of the really cool things that are happening over in Minnesota as well, too. And I think our, our group has been a part of that over the years as well. And I was interested in figuring out how we could utilize that land, renovate it, um, you know, not only make it better habitat for our wildlife, but also make it more usable for our farm. And so we started to have that conversation with our conservationists and how that might work. Um, and that's where it led us to our getting started on a forestry plan. And I'll get into that in a few slides. But then from there now, we've been um, partway through an equip project. Um, after that, run it, we're focusing, been just focusing strictly on this oak savanna area. Um, and that's included using a forestry mower last year, and our goats have worked as kind of a tool to help set back that regrowth. And then this year, um, we are finishing some of the details with the remaining brush um, that we have left, because when we mowed last year, I mean, do you remember all that snow we had? Mm -hmm. Well, we mowed when the snow, oh, <laughs> so we had all that snow, so all of, I mean, it's way better than the 60-year-old buckthorn trees, but all of our like stubble is like up to my knees because we had two feet of snow. Um, so we're kind of, we have more parts to work with, but, um, so, but this year we'll be kind of dealing that main remaining brush, doing more control on the regrowth, and then getting ready to plant a pollinator mix and um, other forage in that area. Um, we're going to kind of see how the goats work with, you know, managing it this season, just because we're going to put that, that mix in, um, and then the plan then is to then plant more more trees into our system the following year and again you continue to use the goats to help manage that regrowth 
And then after that, we're going to kind of, we started, I think the area that we're working is about 10 acres. And our conservationists, we talked about like going forward, we might think about like, how can we, once we see how this works, how can we replicate this in other areas in our, on our farm? And of course, also think about how we can, you know, rep manage that regrowth. Um, Cause if anybody's removed buckthorn before, and I know there's a few other small ruminant grazers, it will come back. Um, is it more manageable when it's small shoots than big trees? But um, that's a concern as well. Like, how do we continue to manage that? So I'm just going to do a little show and tell just a little bit. This is an example of where we managed our goats, or we managed our herd um, to graze our, our hay field and also the edges of our woods. Um, you can kind of see it's a little bit of a before and after of like the tree line difference of the work they do um, in that area. And as I talk about examples, um, one thing I've learned too with like if you're going to be using, I'm sure this is true probably of any species, but like it's really important to like always make sure you monitor where they're at and how much feed they have. And I mean, that's a no brainer, but it, when you're managing brush, sometimes um, like I thought they'd be in here for a few days and the next day I was like, oh, time to move them. Um, they ate a lot and I would keep them for me for this because they were on our hay field in this situation. They were doing a day graze on our hay field, but I would put them into the woods overnight just because I didn't want them to overdo it on my hay field. But I didn't really care at this point with the brush as much in the woods because I'm looking at kind of getting, you know, the, get managing the invasives. Um, do we have internet or not? No, okay. Well, this, the video over here, I was gonna, I'm like, I kind of knew it was a gamble, so that's okay. Um, on the left, this is an example of kind of what it looked like in our oak savanna. Um, in the over before we started doing work on it, on um, the top picture, um, it was an area where it was a little bit more open, um, but it was still very thick. Now a lot of it is, it's very much, it's very open. One of our friends that um, comes over and helps us with stuff on the farm, um, he hunts on our farm too, and he kind of calls it now the Serengeti because it's like. <laughs> Because so much of the buckthorn is gone that it is like considerably night and day different. So um, just some general tips. I'm going to talk a little bit about just some management things, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience working through um, the project itself with NRCS. Hopefully you don't get too critical of me back there when I talk about I'm in a different district, so. <laughs> Um, so some tips for grazing small ruminants in the woods, and I'm sure there's questions later. I know there's some other of you, you who've got experience too, but um, yeah, those, yeah, Great Pyrenees, and I think some, um, one's got a little Merrimack, but I usually call them Great Pyrenees because they're white. It's easy to explain. Um, but, you know, you might need to get your stock acclimated to eating brush if they haven't been used to eating brush. Um, it might take a little bit, um, but eventually, you know, they'll be hungry and they'll get used to it. Um, pre get prepared to move animals sooner than later, sooner than maybe you planned. Um, and, you know, I talked about that, but it, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal. But if you're working with small ruminants, we use, in the woods, we use an electronet fence. And it works well, but it's very labor intensive to put up. So, um, you know, to put up a fence quickly, and you're like, oh, they need food now. Like, it might take a lot, you know, it's not, you know, a 10-minute project. Like if you're enrolling a reel of poly wire um, for cattle in, in pasture. Um, you know, for areas where, again, we talked about not, um, this is, we're working on trying to remove invasives right now, but when we manage them in the future, we're not going to probably keep them in areas as long as what we're doing now, just because if you think of the same practices with, um, you know, grazing your pasture, you don't want to cause damage not only to the undergrowth for the grasses, but also the trees as well, too. Um, predators can be an issue, so we keep dogs out with our, our, our herd and our flock in the woods. Um, and I think they do a pretty good job. I don't want to knock on wood too much, but um, they do a pretty good job of kind of keeping their, their territory kind of marked out compared to like other, um, other predators on, with four feet. Um, supplemental feed. Um, it may, you know, when brush is lush, summer or spring through summer, you'll probably be just fine without supplementing. But supplementing late fall, if you're going to do winter brush control, you may need to supplement or, again, keep them moving fast. Um, 
it, you have to kind of gauge it. And I found that when different areas of our woods, um, we've had to, you kind of assess the forage, you know, the amount of forage that's available, the amount of brush that's available. And as they start to work through it, because every area is a little bit different based on tree species, how much, what's on, in the understory and so forth, it's a little harder to say, well, they're gonna be in this area for a week um, or three days, just because there's a lot of variability. Um, equipment needs for small ruminants. Um, fencing, typically in the woods, we are using Electronet um, and a strong energizer. A strong energizer is always good for sheep and goats. Um, you probably have guessed that. Um, in our pastures, we will use um, poly wire, but out in the woods, I just like that, even though it's a lot of work, I, I prefer to use Electronet just because it's a little bit extra sense of security if something happens with you know, the energizer, maybe battery dies out, um, or you just have a little bit more flexibility. Um, checking it regularly is important. Deer or trees might knock, knock it down. Um, you know, clearing paths can really help with, and you set up fence, um, just because that net fence, but even if you were using other fences too, it's like having the brush and debris out of the way can make your life a lot easier. You're less likely to, you know, curse at yourself where you're fencing. Um, <laughs> It's uh, water, minerals, um, thinking about handling and moving capabilities. So like probably, you know, different, but you think about like you're in the woods, like how, are, how am I going to get them back to the barn or if we need to pull them off, how are we going to do that? Um, we have a couple of different, sometimes, you know, we've used just our stock trailer. Other times we've used a handler. For those of you who work at the Spooner Research Center, this was a retired piece of equipment. Um, we actually use that handler up there a lot um, to move, if we were moving out like we may move a group of go goats out to the back end of our woods and start them there, and then we can kind of they kind of make their way back up towards the where we have permanent pasture, so we can move them back in shelter. Um, you know, if there's enough tree canopy, and especially in the summertime, they'll probably be okay um, without having any formal shelter. If you're getting closer to like late fall, winter, and they're outside, they're probably going to need some type of shelter just for that buffer of wind and keeping them out of the, um, you know, a lot of moisture being wet. And I found even our goats, like our sheep tolerate more, um, but they're, you know, they have a built-in coat. Our goats over time have gotten to handle it better. Um, they don't always like it, but they do pretty good. They impress me sometimes. And then they see me and they whine, but that's all right. Um, so possible equipment, equipment needs you might need for existing woodland renovation. Um, Potentially a brush mower, forestry mower, chainsaw, chemicals control mower, no-till drill. You know, this is like, I'm thinking about tools, and I actually probably should have, well, it's equipment, but I probably could have put my goats and sheep up there on the list as well. Um, so expectations for brush removal. Um, I like to bring this up because I think sometimes people think, oh, goats, especially goats, you know, they'll eat everything. They'll eat all the brush. Like, we'll do one pass, and it'll be all gone. Um, you know, they'll strip trees and branches and eat the leaves, but, um, you know, they're not going to eat whole trees. I'm not saying never, but most likely not eat whole trees, um, you know, thick woody species. Um, you know, and, and part of the idea with this is like, when you look at brush removal or even things like buckthorn, goats can be a really great tool, but it might be a combination approach with working with some type of other mechanical removal, depending on what your goals are. Um, and a lot of times, um, you know, one graze may not be enough to keep that brush set back. You'll need to continue to manage it. Okay, so now I'm going to jump um, back into like working with NRCS. So this timeline is very similar to what I had up front, but this is like when we worked on this project. So we applied, um, we talked with our conservationists and then applied for the forestry plan. Um, you know, then we had a year where we did the forestry plan, then we moved into our project. Um, and then I'm going to just jump into this piece for time. So kind of how it works, because Caleb was, we were talking about this, he thought that it'd be helpful to talk a lot about like kind of how we worked through our, our project. And just because, I, you know, even as I was looking at how we could utilize our woodland and just a little bit, I've talked with folks as I kind of got into this, like, um, I kind of got the vibe that like NRCS in Wisconsin is open to silver pasture, but like how it was going to be done was like a little bit of uncharted territory. 
and this, and again, things may have changed since like I've gotten interested in this and like, and I'm comparing this to like seeing like what maybe some is happening in some other states. And so I kind of knew that it was, there was a possibility out there. And then we also were looking at like, how could we, how could we manage our woods and like take good care of it? And that we knew like manage, manage, um, forestry program with a DNR was out of the picture because I wanted to have our, utilize our livestock in a, in a, a good way. So I had a, a lot of, I talked a lot with our, our conservationist and he's like, well, let's, you know, first step, let's just do a forestry plan and we can go from there. It's not mandatory. I mean, what that comes out of the plan. So, um, I ended up, so I worked with a, um, Forestry TSP, who's actually not too far from here. I've got him on the list here. But I probably took more time than I needed to find a TSP because I was a little apprehensive about finding a forester who was willing to work with, I mean, I know they work with NRCS, but from the perspective of like a holistic perspective of like being able to utilize livestock in the woods, in the managed grazing atmosphere, we had, I had met with um, some other foresters. They worked for timber companies. And I had meant, you know, just, you know, you're walking the woods looking at stuff and you're having conversation and a few were really like, no, no, you know, anti, anti livestock, anything in the woods. So I just, if this is going to work, I wanted to make sure I had somebody who was open to that, um, that piece. And so, um, I worked with Chris and we talked about over the phone about my projects and my goals, talked about like, you know, good habitat, you know, getting rid of, of those invasives. And also the importance of being able to utilize our, it as a piece of our farm. And then um, we also do some maple sugaring. So that was kind of the piece of it. The part that we worked doesn't have or worked on has very few maple trees. But then, you know, we talked about it and then we went through, he came out and walked through our woods and then we went through the plan again. And I even, you know, we had specific questions about the plan. He was willing to talk through them, um, which helped a lot. So we were able to work through that. And then, this is, um, Caleb had mentioned it might be helpful to talk about like some of the practices. So this is what some of the practices, the practices that were outlined in our forestry plan based on, you know, the needs of our, of our, of our farm and our woods. And, um, you know, we kind of, as we talked about this, um, we looked at this with our project um, and our plan, he really considered like goats as like, as a tool we could use, um, you know, for, in this case, mechanical removal of, um, you know, the invasive climate control, and even like with, with the with broad, I'm trying to think in here, with, whether it was you know the buckthorn or the brush and so forth. So it's a little bit different way of at least at the time when we were doing this of thinking about how you could utilize your livestock in a silver pasture project with NRCS. It's not like the grazing, you know, grazing plan where you get fencing and you get um, funds to get water out there, but we're looking at it like how can we renovate this area, this in particular, this oak savanna, by using um, our livestock we have as a means to do that and manage it. Um, so, again, some of this kind of is is a summary of of the that project, that piece that as well, and then the in the bottom is the particular projects that we are working with with our our current project for equip right now with our forestry program. Um, but again, it's like, how are we looking at, we're looking at this one particular area and how do we use our goats as a tool and so forth. And I think like it was helpful to like early on in that plan, you know, to have that conversation with that forester to make sure we kind of had things in check. I also will note too, I forgot in here, um, after the plan then that we did a lot, my conservationist and then one of the state you know, our foresters, we did a walk through of our forest, you know, and again, I'm sure like they were talking about the plan afterwards as well um, and how it fit for our farm. So that is what I have for kind of my show and tell and share of renovation. Someday we will have a nice oak savanna that we will be managing as part of you know, our, our farm system. But right now we're in the thick of things with making it, you know, a more functional ecosystem. Are there questions for Caleb and, and Leslie? Sure. Will the go